our viewers welcome back to part two of this interview and uh, i will not take much of your time we go straight to how Matt met his wife yes Matt, welcome back hello uh you have a lovely wife i met her about 10 years ago when she visited kenya mm -hmm. and uh, i can surely tell you that uh, she has a good heart how did you meet her well, it's quite interesting. So I was leading worship at a youth ministry um, before I had the uh, the face bashing in at the drug deal that went bad. And, and I would go through these little seasons like I would have, you know, two or three months where I'd be able to pretty much stay off of drugs and then I'd fall back into it for a few months. And then I'd try to be clean for a little bit and I'd fall. Because, you know, we can all, by our own, you know, free will, I call it white knuckling it, you know, for for a short period of time. But um, if you don't allow Jesus to literally change you from the inside out, you always end up going back. And so I'd go back and forth, back and forth. Well, during this time... Uh, in this youth ministry she was serving as a youth leader and I remember the first time I met her I was watching her talk to some people and the Holy Spirit said that's gonna be your wife and I thought yeah that no that that can't be because I'm a mess and there's no way that I can do that right I like there's no way that I could have a godly woman like that and be living this lifestyle so that can't work um, and then when I got my face bashed in, I was in the hospital. My youth pastor came. She also came to visit me and saw me all bashed up in the hospital bed. And she just thought, yeah, he's never going to, they're never going to fix that. You know, because I mean, my, my face was so destroyed. It was just swollen here, bloody here, ripped apart here, you know, all over the place. And she thought, wow, he's never going to look the same. Um, and I went to Teen Challenge. I was there for a year. And again, the Lord just continues to remind me like, hey, you know, if you'll walk this process out the right way, I have this all taken care of for you. Um, so I had this little picture of her <laughs> that I kept on top of my bed. We were, I was in a bunk bed in this because, you know, they in Teen Challenge, it's almost like jail, except it's Christian jail. And uh, so we're in these bunk beds in this little tiny room and I've got the picture of her up in my uh my bed and I would pray every night, you know, and I'd look at it every night. And in Teen Challenge, you're not allowed to have pictures of girlfriends, only your wife. You're not allowed to have a picture of girlfriends if you're not married. Well, she wasn't my girlfriend because I had never talked to her about what I heard God say. So I was able to slide by the rule. <laughs> they, they would always come in and be like, you're not allowed to have pictures of your girlfriend. I'm like, she's not my girlfriend. Not yet. You know? <laughs> And so I slipped by the rule. Um, so that whole year I was in Teen Challenge. I never told her that God had told me that because he told me not to not to say anything to her. It was, it was a good thing, I'm sure, because uh, if I would have told her then, I, I just wasn't in a place to be able to have that kind of relationship anyway. Um, and then I got out of Teen Challenge and my youth pastor uh, moved from Michigan down to Kansas City to plant a church. So my now wife which wasn't my wife then she went down there with him to help his family uh, plant that church because that's originally where she was from her parents lived in kansas city um so uh, the lord also called me to go help plant that church so uh after i graduated teen challenge after god completely changed my life um i went down to help with the church plant and i was down there for about a year and the whole time, you know, God continued to tell me, you know, don't say anything to her, don't say anything to her. And I just continued to build a friendship and um, God worked it out. One day uh, she realized that I had affections for her, even though I, I hadn't said anything, but we were building this friendship. And finally she went to our pastor and said, hey, I think, I think Matt Jones likes me. And he was like, boy, it sure took you long enough to figure that out, you know, and so... Uh, so then I had to ask his permission because he was kind of like a father figure in her life. Her her uh, birth father uh, wasn't around. So, um, so yeah, I asked his permission. He gave me his permission. 
we got engaged. We never, we didn't even really date. We just went straight to engagement because we have been friends for years. So we, you know, I, I actually feel like that's the best way to do things because, uh, you know, that you date this person, date that person, date this person. It's, in my opinion, I feel it's just best to be friends with everyone and then determine, okay, which one does God have for me? Yeah, you, and then you have a discussion. If you both feel the same way, you get engaged. And, you know, I believe in short engagements <laughs> and uh, long marriages, you know. So, uh, yeah, so we got married and, and, yeah, moved back to Michigan and got in ministry. So, Jessica's testimony. Yeah, so about uh, two years ago, two or so years ago, she started getting really sick. Um, started coughing a lot, like just all night long she'd cough and I thought man what is going on like well, at first we just thought it was a cold but then it lasted too long and then we thought well maybe it's pneumonia and then we go to the doctor and they'd say oh yeah you got pneumonia and here's some antibiotics and so we just thought she was having a hard time kicking this pneumonia um, but it lasted for months and months and we kept going to the doctor and they'd say something different you know and then finally I was like look this is lasting too long there's no way this is still pneumonia and if it was, it should be gone by now. So we need to see a specialist. So we go to the specialist, and the specialist said, oh, she's got adult asthma. And I'm like, Man, look, I'm not a doctor, but this guy's crazy. My wife has never had, pneumo or never had uh, asthma her entire life. You just don't get to be 40 years old and all of a sudden magically get asthma. You know, like uh, something's not right. So one night it got so bad, I took her into the emergency room. And they took an x-ray and the doctor said uh, she had interstitial lung disease, which is a really broad term for inflammation of the lung tissue. There can be hundreds of causes for that. So he's like, look, I don't know the cause. All I know is your lung tissue doesn't look normal. So you need to get this figured out. So uh, since we live in a small town and we didn't have the, the best doctors around there, it's probably why she got misdiagnosed so many times. We decided to go to University of Michigan, which is a two and a half hour drive from us, but it's the, one of the best hospitals in Michigan. And they started taking all kinds of tests. And uh, about three weeks after we started getting all those tests, uh, we got the call. And the doctor said, uh, is your husband there? And I'm thinking, oh, this has got to be bad if he's wanting me to be there. He said, uh, I'm so sorry, but it's cancer and it's pretty extensive. So we're going to immediately transfer you to an oncologist, a cancer doctor. Uh, so we went to the cancer doctor. They took more scans and he came in the office. He said, um, I'm so sorry. This, this should never happen to someone so young. Um, this is probably why they missed it. They misdiagnosed it because uh, someone your age that has never smoked before uh, normally never gets lung cancer this young. And so it was stage four lung cancer. Um, there was so much cancer in her lungs that you couldn't even see the air on the scan. Normally when they scan your lungs, there's a white outline and then the black in the middle of the lungs represents the air because it's like a void, it's space. But uh, the scan, there was no black. It was all white, side to side, top to bottom, full of cancer, both both lungs, which made sense why she couldn't breathe. She barely could, you know, take a breath. Um, and uh, they, I could just tell by the looks on their face, like it wasn't good, you know. Uh, it had spread into other parts of her body. It got into her ribs, her shoulder. It spread into her other places. Uh, she had a lymph node in the middle of her lungs that had filled up with cancer that closed both of the airways that go up to the esophagus. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it wasn't good. It wasn't good. They kind of, I mean, they didn't say this because obviously most of the time they're not going to tell you, hey, you're going to die soon. But, uh, but there was one scan that she went to get where she all of a sudden realized how bad it was because when she got out of the scan all the nurses were just like oh honey 
you just go home and you, you know, have the best quality time with your family as you can, you know, with the time that's left. And so it was kind of like, you know, go home and spend time with your family so that you can die. Um, but as soon as the doctor started saying those kind of things, you know, I, look, I know what God's done in my life. I've seen him do miracles. Uh, I've been a part of multiple ministries where I've seen people with cancer miraculously healed. And so I just, I, I know the word. I know uh, the promises in God's word. And I just knew, like, no, no, nope, this isn't, this isn't right. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's your opinion. I know that that's what you say the scans show. But uh, I'm going to choose not to believe that report. Mm -hmm. I'm going to believe the report of the Lord, which says that God's plans for you are not for harm, but they're for good to give you a future and a hope. And this doesn't look like a future and a hope. This looks like harm. So I'm going to choose to agree this is not God, that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, not God. And this is a work of the enemy. And the Bible says that Jesus came to destroy the works of the enemy. So then we have to destroy this. Yes. You know, and so that, that was my mindset. Um, my wife asked me later, she said, were you ever scared? Because like everybody, like all of our family members, you know, her, her parents, my parents, everybody was scared. And, and, you know, they had the right to be scared. But I, I, I couldn't afford to be scared. I just said, no, this is not going to happen. We're going to we're going to get we're going to get through this. God's going to heal you, period. So uh, I began to speak the scripture over her, began to pray over her every night, um, began to believe God. And uh, we didn't see much change right away. Um, At this point, how did your kids take that report? Well, I was very careful how I communicated it to my children because the Lord had told me very clearly, it's your job to maintain the atmosphere in the home. You must maintain an atmosphere of faith. I can't be getting up every morning and feeling this depressive atmosphere. Like faith needs an atmosphere to grow. It's like a greenhouse. Uh, you have to be able to build a greenhouse with the right temperature, the right sunlight, the right warmth, right? To have the seed grow, right? Uh, to the, the height that needs to grow, to the maturity so it can produce the fruit. And if you don't have the right atmosphere, it's not going to grow. And so... I was very careful. Um, I told my kids the truth. Mm -hmm. I said, look, uh, they've told us your mom has lung cancer. But here's what's going to happen. God's going to heal her. It's going to, you know, it's all going to be fine. But I need you to be praying. Yes. This is how I need you to pray. These are the scriptures I need you to believe. And we're going to get through this. So I just was very, I, I was honest. I don't believe in, you know, telling them something that's not true. But I do believe that we have to be very careful how we communicate the truth as to inspire faith and not fear, right? Um, uh, one uh, of my wife's friends came over and uh, she brought her husband who had been through cancer. And, oh my gosh, he started saying, oh, you're going to suffer so much and you may not live. And he started just speaking all this fear. And I looked at my wife and I was like, you know, like, we got to get him out of here, you know. And uh, we got them out of the house. Yeah. And, and after they left, I told her, I said, I love you, but that man is not allowed in my house again. I'm sorry, but if any of your friends have any attitude other than faith and belief you're going to get healed, they're not allowed in my home. I love you, but I need you to know that because I love you, I will not allow anyone in this house that, you know. And so at that point, God was very clear, like, this is your job to maintain the atmosphere. And from that point on, we had no fear in that home. So two trips to heaven for Jessica. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so right after... Um, we got the bad news uh, that, you know, they didn't think she was going to make it. Uh, and I just made the decision, well, th this is not going to be the case. God's going to move. Uh, I started making plans. Um, we are part of a ministry that's out in Northern California where people, they fly in from all over the world. You know, Japan, China, Russia, everywhere. Uh, because there's a supernatural healing ministry at that that church that is unlike any other I've seen. Um, 
people go in there with cancer, tumors fall off of people, stage four cancer gets healed. I mean, so uh, that that was the first trip that I that I planned immediately was to go out there to Bethel Church in Redding, California. And at the same time, I did research uh, to see what kind of alternative treatments that we could start. Because one thing I know is that the uh, in America, um, the cancer industry makes billions of dollars. And they make those billions of dollars off of the treatments that they have. Um, but for that reason, they don't allow other natural treatments that are competing. Yes. So um, I know some... Uh, people that have gone out of the country to get uh, alternative treatments that they don't allow in America. Um, <clears throat> so I found one in Mexico. So that same trip, we went up to Redding, California uh, for about a week. I had people lay hands on her and pray for her. She was so sick, she couldn't even walk. I had to basically almost carry her around. Um, she was throwing up in the parking lot as soon as we get out. I mean, it was not good. You know, her body was starting to shut down, really. Um, but I just continued to to bring her through those places. A lot of people thought we were crazy for traveling with her that sick. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the way, the way I looked at it, it was like, okay, yeah, she's sick. But if we stay home and don't do anything about it, you know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm going to bring her where I believe she's going to have the most chance of surviving, which was the supernatural ministry and uh, the alternative treatment. So then we went down to Mexico and we, uh, had her see the doctor down there. I purchased the alternative treatments. I did a fundraiser to help raise money for that. And then um, she was so sick going back to the airport that we couldn't even make our flight. Um, so I had to put her in a hotel for the night and try to get her at least back to a place where she could walk again. Um, and we finally made a flight the next day and uh, got her back. And as soon as we got back, Okay, I'm going to stop right there and go back. While we were in Redding, California, uh, she had her first trip to heaven. So we were at that church receiving prayer for the cancer, and um, we were in a worship service. <clears throat> and we're sitting uh, halfway back in the sanctuary, and it's dark because uh, in, in America they they lower the lights and they make the they create the atmosphere, you know. And so it's dark in the room, and they're in the middle of the worship set. Um, and she's sitting next to me because she's in so much pain and so weak she can't stand. And she begins to have this encounter. Now, I didn't know at the time this was happening. She told me later. As she's sitting there, she kind of had her head on the, the chairs in front of her. And as she's sitting there, she had this just very strong sense that there was someone standing next to her with a child. Holding like a, a toddler. And not you. Not me. But she opened her eyes and looked around, didn't see anybody. So then she put her head back down and she felt very strongly that that was happening still. And she looked around, nothing. And then she thought, oh, maybe this is something in the spirit. So she put her head back down and she was taken into an encounter uh, with the Lord. And she saw Jesus standing there and she said he was so tall, she could only see like from his waist down. And she saw Jesus holding this toddler. She saw the child's legs dangling and kicking as he was holding him. She said he had uh, these tube, white tube socks with green stripes and sneakers on. And all of a sudden, she just knew that that was the child that we had lost. Um, we have four children that are alive. We did have one child that, that died after about uh, five months in, in the womb. And um, you know he went to heaven and we, we named him uh, Eli which means ascended one. And she knew in that moment, okay, that's my son that we lost and Jesus is holding him. And now she sees like she's in heaven. And she saw this great crowd of people all around her. And she just immediately knew that's the cloud of witnesses. And there's just innumerable number of people and all of a sudden this face came out of the crowd and walked up to her and it was her grandmother that had passed years ago gave her a kiss on the forehead and she knew in that moment jesus was giving her a choice that i have this gift for you right here you can come and meet your son right now um and you know her son was waiting for her in heaven like that was the option like you can come and you can meet your son right now that that you lost 
uh, or you can stay there. And she made the decision that I'll wait to open up that gift if that means I can stay here and open up all the gifts I haven't opened up yet here on earth. And uh, and then she woke back up. And I didn't know that that had just happened. I'm just worshiping, you know. And she told me about it later. Um, And it was a very powerful moment for her because it gave her this, this hope of, hey, you know, Jesus has given me an option here. So I believe that, that I can be healed, sure. you know. And then we got back. Uh, all that happened with going to Mexico and um, missing the flight. And we finally got back to Michigan. And she had a, we had to get back quickly because she had another scan that we had to get. So we got back just in time to get the scan. And she was so sick. It's a two and a half hour drive back home. I thought, I'm not going to drive her back home. We're just going to stay in a hotel and we'll wait here until the results. And then we don't have to drive all the way back. So she's sleeping in the hotel. I'm awake because I'm listening to uh, a message on my computer from the pastor of that church that we had just come back from. And I look over at her and she is sleeping as peaceful as I'd seen her sleep in months. And I thought, well, praise God, you know, she's sleeping peaceful. She's not waking up coughing all the time. This is great. And then I hold, I, I, and then I heard the Holy Spirit say, wake her up and call the ambulance. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what? Like she's, this is like the best she's slept in a long time. I'm not going to wake her up. And the Holy Spirit says, call the ambulance. I'm thinking, why am I going to call an ambulance? Call the ambulance. Uh, here we go. You know, so I'm like, I just, I can't not listen to that. So I call an ambulance and they say, well, well what's the emergency? And I'm thinking, now what? There is no emergency. What am I supposed to say? You know, and they're like, well, we're not going to come without an emergency. And I was like, well, she's having a hard time breathing. Because I thought, I'm really not lying because she's got a problem with her lungs. So I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to think of something. That, <laughs> I just try to come up with a reason. And so they sent the, the ambulance and the paramedics. And they came up, took her vital signs. They said, well, everything seems fine. You know, what do you want us to do? We, we can leave or we can take her in to, to double check. And I'm like, well... God told me to call them, so take her to double check. So they took her into the hospital, and they did all these tests, and the doctor came into the room. He said, you know, I don't know how, how you knew this, but uh, if you wouldn't have gotten her in here, she could be dead right now. Yeah, because she had two liters, more than two liters, of fluid around her heart. I think it's called a pericardial sac, and it's a sac around your heart. And it's only supposed to have a little bit of fluid, but it had built up over two liters. And what they say is when it has that much fluid, it puts so much pressure on the heart, it just makes it stop beating. And at the same time, she had had these blood clots form in her lungs, which also could have made the blood flow stop. So there was two ways she could have died right there at the same time. And so, yeah, yeah. And so they admitted her into the hospital. Um, put her on blood thinners for the blood clots. They had to put a tube into her heart to drain all that fluid out. So they got all the fluid drained. And um, while they were doing that, she was taken into heaven again. So she's laying in bed. I went to, I left, I went to get food. And uh, her mom was in the room with her while this happened. She was lifted up out of her body. And she was taken above the hospital. And she looked down upon the hospital. And it's like she saw all the rooms from above without the roof. So she just saw straight into all the rooms. She saw all the beds. And in every single room, there was like a white, she called it a white wisp. So like a white mist or a white, it was like a, not like a person per se, but a figure without a form like just a cloudy white mist in each room and uh all of a sudden she saw a hand grab a a switch like a big electrical switch that you'd use to like turn on the power for a building and pull it down and she heard this and all the lights went out and it was dark and she said in that moment she had never 
felt that much emptiness and darkness before. She said it was kind of freaking her out. And then all of a sudden, the hand went chunk and put the switch back on. All the lights came back on. And every single white wisp that was in each room went whoosh, and all came together and whoosh, right down into her room. And then they grabbed these seven pillars and began to place them in her abdomen. Now, she's above watching this happen to herself. And she came to realize later those were angels but they were placing pillars in her ab abdomen and she didn't know what that meant at that time but as soon as she told me i knew like that was that's your healing like they're putting in you what you need for your body to be healed right and i'm sure that there's other there's there's more meaning to, to that but i didn't really care what the what the pillars stood for as much as i knew why they were doing it right and um, they placed all these pillars inside of her abdomen and then all of a sudden she was sucked back into her body and she woke up and while she was up there uh, she also saw into heaven and she saw this young girl uh, when she was a when my wife was a young child there was a, a young girl in her church that they uh, believe committed suicide and when they were at the funeral um, the pastor told my wife's brother that that little girl was in hell and it caused her brother to walk away from the Lord. And her brother still is away from the Lord. Uh, it goes all the way back to that situation. But while she was in heaven, she saw that little girl in heaven. And when she came back into her body, she turned to her mom and she said, Tell Ben that little girl's okay. Tell Ben that she's in heaven. And so... Um, that was powerful. But when, when her mom heard that, her mom started freaking out because she's like, wait a minute, how do you know she's in heaven? What's going on? Are you dying? You're not leaving me now. You know, she started freaking out. Well, then I came back in the room and I was clueless to anything that had happened. I'm like, here's the food. We can eat now. I turned the TV on. I'm a football fan. So I turned the TV on to the football game and I'm like, all right, we got the football game. Let's go. I had no idea that it just happened. <laughs> but my wife told me later that it was good that I came in because there was a lot of fear in the room from her mom thinking that she was dying. And I just came in, shifted the atmosphere. Hey, let's celebrate, eat food and watch the football game. <laughs> and really, honestly, from that point forward, things began to get better. Um, they, they began to treat her with medicine. And uh, each day she got better, 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 better. Uh, we went back for a scan the next month half of the cancer was already gone within a month. Uh, and then we went back a month later and pretty much all of the cancer was gone. Her lungs were clear. And now when we get scans, they can't even find any cancer in her lungs at all. Um, they see scarring, like, cause when cancer's in your body, it, it does things to tissue. And so they can see like the remaining scars uh, at different places. Like there's one little spot in her lungs that still has some inflammation because of the scar tissue. And there's some spots on her bones where there's scars from where the cancer was. But they have not yet been able to find active cancer in her body. So um, the doctors won't say she's cancer free because I've asked them, like, if you can't find the cancer, why are you not saying she's cancer free? Well, we don't say that. When someone has stage four cancer, we know that cancer never really leaves the body. And I'm like, well, that's what you say. Yeah, that's what you say. But I say she's cancer free. Yeah. So... So pray, you know, we, we just praise God. We thank God. Um, we know that God is the reason why she is still alive while she's been healed. I mean, you know, the doctors are definitely a part of it, too. I also believe that doctors are given to us. Their wisdom is given to them by God. And so all the things they do uh, help us as well. Um, but when she was that far uh, gone, I know that it was, you know, that, that just the doctors could not have helped her get to this point that uh, the doctors have helped but uh, the Holy Spirit also brought divine healing and uh, that's why she's here with us now so and she's healthier now than I've seen her probably the whole time we've been married I mean she's even healthier than she was before uh, she had cancer many people believe that uh, once the pastor prays for you you receive instant miracle instant healing uh, but according to this story, uh, it is a process. Sometimes it's a process. Well, it was even a process with Jesus. Uh, so we see in the Bible that Jesus uh, prayed for people, 
Well, Jesus didn't even really pray. He just said, be healed, and they would be healed, right? He just did a declaration most of the time. Um, but we also see that there were times where Jesus didn't see the instant healing either. There was a man that was blind. Uh, he spit into the dirt. And, and, and that even shows us the process. He didn't just say, be healed. He began a process. He got the dirt. Then he spit in the dirt. Then he rubbed the dirt together. Then he placed the dirt. This is all process. Placed the dirt and the mud on the eyes. Then go to the priest. So process, process, process. And after the man did the process, he was fully healed. And so not even Jesus got 100% immediate results. But Jesus always got results, one way or the other. And so we see that there are sometimes miracles which happen instantaneously. And then there are healings. Healings can be progressive. So you have miracles and you have healings that can be progressive. And with you know my wife, it was a progressive healing. You know, each day she got better and better and better until she was fully better. So. So the whole ordeal has brought your family closer to God than before. Yes, for sure. Talk to my viewer. Tell him about this faith because it's all about faith. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, when you read about God and you hear about what God does, that gives you a certain level of faith. Um, it's encouraging, right? It gives you hope that those same things can happen in your life. But when you actually go through a situation that is life and death, when you have death looking you right in the eye and you know staring at you and staring you down, um, and at that point you have to make a decision. I'm either going to let him win or I'm going to say no. I choose to believe all these stories I've heard. I choose to believe everything I've read about Jesus. I choose to believe all of the testimonies of other people being healed. And if God can do it for them, why can't he do it for me? I choose to believe that he can. And then you see God do it, right? Uh, it just, it, it increases your faith because, you know, what does the Bible say? Taste and see that the Lord is good, right? And so um, hearing about it's one thing, learning about it's one thing, but experiencing it is a whole nother thing. And it just brings your faith to that next place because you know that you know that you know that you've seen God do it. In a Christian context, would you say we have radical faith? <laughs> well, many would say that that was crazy faith. Uh, you know, there were people that, you know, thought that there are people that still think that I was crazy to take her out to California while she was that sick, that I was, you know, making her suffer and, you know, making the pain worse. And it, the pain may have been worse a little bit. You know, I don't deny that, but I believed I had to do that. I believed that I had to um, take her to where I felt the Holy Spirit was saying to take her. And um, so, yeah, I would say that is radical faith because uh, it goes against all of the uh, doctors, uh, you know, suggestions, um, all the experts that would say, hey, you know, she's not in any condition to fly. You know, when we were in uh, Redding, California, she got really sick. We had to take her in to get some medicine. And they were like, why in the world would you travel across the country with her? You know, she should not be traveling. So was your faith at the same level with her faith? I mean, did she try to resist going to California? She, at that point, she just... I'm trying to think of the right word. Um, she just gave way for my faith. Wow. She basically, she allowed me to have faith for her because she was so weak and she could barely do anything. She just, I'm letting my husband have the faith that we need right now. And that's where, you know, the two become one flesh when you're married. And so when the one is too weak to have faith, then we need to be able to stand up and have faith for them. Last one for our viewer. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible for those that believe. And uh, God is not a respecter of persons. If he does it for one person, he can do it for you. And thank you for creating time for this interview. Oh, for sure, definitely. Thank you. Yep.